As a bitter winter storm barrels toward the Ocean Ranger oil rig, safety is little concern. It's built to be unsinkable after all, except it does. And the answers now seem simple. It's Sunday, February 14, 1982, and as a storm is approaching Newfoundland from the south, a shore-based radio operator of the Mobile Oil of Canada company contacts nearby offshore oil rigs to warn them. One of the rigs contacted is the Ocean Ranger, the world's largest semi-submersible oil rig. Even though it is designed to withstand much larger storms than the one forecast, as a precautionary measure, the crew on the rig stop drilling and withdraw to their quarters. The evening comes, and the storm hits the rig in full swing. However, the rig's construction is sturdy enough to take it. Only a tiny porthole in the ballast control room gets broken. Half an hour before midnight, a radio operator on the shore receives a typical weather report from Ocean Ranger. There's no mention of anything wrong on the rig, not even the slightest hint of what is about to happen. Today's documentary is brought to you by The Ridge Wallet. Is your wallet stuffed like a turkey? Do your keys sound like a fire alarm? Well, then you need today's sponsor, The Ridge Wallet. Built with high-end materials designed to last, their wallets expand to carry up to 12 cards, plus room for cash. There are over 30 colors and styles, including my favorite, Burnt Titanium. You'll also love the Ridge Key Case, which organizes up to six keys into a minimalistic compact silhouette. Do you hear that? Very nice and quiet. And of course, each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. If you're looking for the perfect gift, head over to ridge.com slash darkhistory to save up to 40% through December 22nd. That's ridge.com slash darkhistory. One hour and 30 minutes later, the Ocean Ranger's senior foreman sends a report that the rig is listing badly. Ten minutes after, he is sending mayday calls. The nearby standby vessel hurries to the rig's location and finds crashed lifeboats scattered all around. Alas, they can't reach them due to high waves. The storm is too powerful. Eighty-four men for the rig are left to the mercy of the sea. By morning, the storm is over and the waters are calm again. A rescue helicopter hovers over the area, looking for survivors. However, there's no living soul in sight. The entire oil rig is missing. Only anchor buoys float where the rig used to be. The storm and the sea have hidden every trace of a tragedy that befell the Ocean Ranger. On Valentine's Day in 1982, Ocean Ranger was drilling the exploration well J-34 at the Hibernia oil field. It was positioned southeast of Newfoundland at the Grand Banks Plateaus. On board were 84 workers, of which 56 were locals. The lack of jobs in the region and the prospect of a lucrative oil business attracted many young Newfoundlanders. At 8 a.m., workers on the rig received an incoming storm warning forecasting winds of 90 knots and waves up to 37 feet. The workers began preparing for the blow, and at around 4.30 p.m., the drilling stopped. The drilling pipe was disconnected and retracted, and the workers retired to their quarters, waiting for the storm to come. At 7 p.m., a giant wave hit a nearby oil rig, Sedco 706. As reported by workers, the height of the wave was far above predicted between 70 and 80 feet. Even though it caused minor damage to the rig structure, Sedco 706 rode out the storm. Another oil rig drilling in the Hibernia oil fields, the Zapata Ugland, was also hit by the same wave, but did not sustain significant damage. The wave reached Ocean Ranger, which was significantly larger, shortly after it hit the two other rigs. It was the largest semi-submersible oil rig in the world. Even the 70-foot-high waves were not supposed to threaten its upper hull and the drilling floor. The workers on the rig were well assured of this. Held in position by three strong anchor cables at each corner, Ocean Ranger was easily withstanding the powerful and tall waves. The only damage it suffered was broken glass at the ballast control room porthole on one of the starboard columns. A radio operator on the nearby Seaforth Highlander support vessel overheard the radio communication and witnessed the incident taking place at 8 p.m. 
The damage was repaired in a couple of minutes. The crew sealed the broken porthole and picked up the shattered glass. However, a seemingly insignificant incident grew into a more noteworthy problem. With the glass broken, the room filled with gallons of seawater, which soaked the ballast control panel and caused a short circuit. Since the panel was controlling the ballast tank valves, it began to misbehave. Due to a short circuit, they were opening and closing on their own, allowing water to overflow into the wrong tanks and, even worse, letting the seawater fill the ballast tanks. With more water in ballast tanks, the rig would submerge even more and thus become vulnerable to the high waves. Senior ballast operator Donald Rathbun and his assistant Dominic Dyke tried to take control of the panel, but got an electrical shock each time they tried to touch it. The only way Rathbun could stop the valves from misbehaving was to shut the power down completely. But the problem was that no one knew where the switch was. It was only at around 9 p.m. that the electrician found the correct switch and turned it off. Finally, misfunctioning valves were under control. At 9.06 p.m., Ocean Rangers senior drilling foreman Jack Jacobson contacted his colleagues at Sedco 706 and Zapata Uglin to check how they were withstanding the storm. He informed them of the broken porthole incident and that all ballast control equipment was now functioning normally. An hour later, he repeated the same thing to his superintendent Merv Graham on shore at St. John's. The last radio communication that day was the weather report sent from the Ocean Ranger to the shore at 11.30 p.m. There was no mention that the rig had any problems whatsoever. Nothing suggested that only an hour and a half later, at 1 a.m., Jacobson would urge Graham to call the Coast Guard for help. In a radio correspondence, Jacobson reported the rig was listing to the bow 8 to 10 degrees and needed to get the people off the rig. Nothing they did could prevent the rig from tipping further. It was sinking unstoppably with 84 people on board. As listing increased with each minute, at 1.05 a.m., Jacobson contacted the Seaforth Highlander support vessel and asked them to help. Five minutes later, Ocean Ranger's radio operator contacted the onshore operator asking him to transmit a mayday signal. The last message from the rig came at 1.30 a.m. There will be no further radio communications from Ocean Ranger. We are going to lifeboat stations. With the list now at nearly 15 degrees, the rig was beyond saving, and all of its crew had already boarded lifeboats. Even though the rig was badly listing, the men had enough time to board the three fiberglass lifeboats, enough to take all personnel and release them into the water. They were equipped with radios and designed to withstand the harsh weather and cold sea. These lifeboats were the crew's last straw of salvation. At least, that's what they believed. As they began descending the lifeboats from 60-foot-high davits, strong winds reaching 80 knots smashed them against the tilting rig and cracked them open. To make things even worse, once they reached the water, the crew had problems releasing the lifeboats from the ropes. So there they were, their lifeboats filling with freezing water while they struggled to get them off the hook. The chances of surviving the conditions were minimal. When the Seaforth Highlander arrived at the scene at 2 a.m., they found a solitary lifeboat floating with eight men inside. All around them were pieces of wrecked lifeboats and abandoned life vests. The Highlander sailed towards the lifeboat but couldn't drag it closer since it lacked the equipment of a rescue boat. Instead, they approached the lifeboat as close as they could as survivors tried to reach the Highlander's gunwales. Unfortunately, this was an almost impossible task on such a rough sea. As they attempted to reach the aft deck, the survivors tumbled off the lifeboat and into the cold water. Not one of them was saved. Half an hour later, the first rescue helicopter arrived. By that time, all 84 men from the Ocean Ranger had succumbed to hypothermia and drowned. An hour later, at 3.38 a.m., Ocean Ranger disappeared from radar. In the morning, neither helicopters flying over the location nor vessels that had arrived to rescue the crew could find a single trace of the disaster. There were only anchor buoys floating in the calm sea. In the days that followed, Search and rescue teams recovered 22 bodies from the sea. 
The examination showed they all died from freezing and drowning. 64 people were never found. They all lost their lives escaping from a rig that was considered to be unsinkable. Mobile oil company officials and the deceased families were left wondering how on earth it could happen. As it turned out, it all began with the broken porthole. When it was launched in 1976, Ocean Ranger was proudly presented as the largest semi-submersible oil rig, practically unsinkable. Rig was first put into use in 1976 in the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska. After that, it operated in New Jersey and Ireland. Finally, in 1980, Odeco leased it to Mobile Oil Canada Limited for $93,000 per day. At Hibernia oil fields, the platform conducted exploratory drills for the company. Ocean Ranger's dimensions were impressive. It was 396 feet long, 262 feet wide, and 337 feet high. On top of it was an upper hull with two decks that carried an accommodation area, a drill floor, and a heli deck. The upper hull rested on eight vertical columns. Apart from providing structural support, these columns housed equipment and provided storage, routed pipes, ducts, and electrical wiring. In the third starboard column was a ballast control room, while each stern column housed an elevator connecting the upper hull to the pontoons. The entire structure was supported by an additional framework of braces and trusses. Ocean Ranger was a semi-submersible type of oil rig. It meant that it didn't rest on the sea floor, but on two large pontoons that consisted of 16 tanks, which served as storage for ballast water. Pumping the water in and out of these tanks regulated the rig's height. These operations were controlled via the system of pipelines connecting the pumps and tanks and remotely operated valves from the ballast control room in the third starboard column. In addition, each pontoon had a pump room and a propulsion room in the tapered section at the stern. Now the question is, how such a mighty 25,000 tons heavy oil rig could be sunk by a broken porthole 12 inches in diameter. The truth is the broken porthole only started a chain of events led by human errors that eventually resulted in the rig sinking. Once the ballast control panel got soaked and the valves in the ballast tanks went wild, the operator, Rathbun, got the situation under control by shutting off the power. Around midnight, however, the ballast control room restored the power believing that the control panel had dried out. They wanted to take the water out from the ballast tanks. This would raise the rig's upper deck beyond the reach of the high waves. Unfortunately, the decision was fatal. By restoring the power, the valves began to malfunction again and allowed a surge of seawater into the bow tanks. As a result, the rig started to list at the port bow. Realizing what he had done, Rathbun tried to manually close the valves between the ballast tanks at the bow and the pump room at the stern, but had no success. Desperate to fix things and stop the listing, Rathbun switched on the pump and tried to drain out the water from the bow. What he didn't know, and probably should have as a senior ballast operator, is that the rig was equipped with a suction pump. Because it relied on atmospheric pressure, it could barely move out the water below its level. This was exactly what happened when the rig started to incline, and the bow went far lower than the stern where the pump was located. Instead, it had the opposite effect. The open valves allowed more water to enter the bow tanks. In Rathbun's case, it would have been better to start pumping out the water from the ballast tanks closer to the pump room. This way, he would have gradually straightened the rig and created conditions to pump the water out of the bow tanks. Then. A final blow struck the rig. As the entire construction inclined, high waves reached the tip of the corner column on the port bow. The water started to fill the hollow column through a chain locker opening. Thousands of gallons of water flooded the column, thus increasing the listing even more. Rathbun and his crew were completely unaware of the situation because the rig was not equipped with floating sensors in the columns. Once the listing reached 15 degrees from the vertical, it came to the point of no return. The world's largest semi-submersible oil rig sunk in only three and a half hours. The crew on board was both unable to prevent the sinking and helped it happen. 
On March 17, 1982, the Canadian Royal Commission on the Disaster was set up to investigate why the Ocean Ranger sank and why none of the crew survived. The Commission spent the next two years interviewing witnesses, recovering vital parts from the rig, and conducting studies to understand what caused the tragedy. The conclusion was that besides several design flaws, such as a lack of watertight hatches for portholes and chain lockers on the rig, Mobile Oil and Odeco completely disregarded the importance of emergency situation training and worker safety. The rig lacked proper life-saving equipment, and the workers didn't know how to use the little they had. Some Ocean Ranger workers later reported how they never had proper evacuation training. The rare training sessions they had were held on Sunday afternoons and were not taken seriously. The Commission also found that persons assigned to operate the ballast control system, which is critical to the stability of the submersible, were not required by any regulation to have formal training. In conclusion, the disaster could have been prevented if the crew had been more qualified. The Canadian government responded to the Commission's report by introducing new and improved regulations for rig operations. These included dislocating ballast control rooms to more elevated positions and less complex ballast control systems. Furthermore, compulsory formal training was introduced for all ballast operators. Equally as important were the new standards regarding the workers' safety and training in emergency procedures. Lifeboat launching systems were improved and immersion suits were introduced as mandatory equipment. These immersion suits were designed to protect the wearer from hypothermia if immersed in cold water for a prolonged period of time, something Ocean Ranger lacked at the time of the disaster. In addition, each worker on the rig was required to undergo a training program in emergency evacuation and learn to use life-saving equipment. These improvements, however, were not enough to ease the pain of the victims' families. Most of them filed suits against Mobile Oil and Odeco for negligence in providing proper training and life-saving equipment for the workers, which resulted in 84 deaths. Ultimately, the lawsuits were settled out of court with a compensation package valued at 20 million U.S. dollars. Sadly, Ocean Ranger's death toll didn't stop at 84. In June 1983, the Canadian government hired a company to refloat the rig and sink it into deeper waters as it was posing a threat to shipping. During the operation, three divers lost their lives. Two were killed by an underwater explosion and the third was hit by a falling object. Finally, in August 1983, Ocean Ranger was sunk for good, leaving behind grieving families of 84 workers in the memory of a tragedy resulting from sheer human negligence. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.